Hi, I'm Rob Feasy, Neurology Business Manager for Carl Storch UK. Welcome to Bounce 2020. Here behind me you'll see our virtual urology stand. Please follow the link and come inside to take a look at some of our focus product areas. Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, to you this year's BGI lecturer, uh, Mr. Richard Kerr. Richard Kerr qualified from the London Hospital and trained in surgery and neurosurgery in London, Oxford and Melbourne before being appointed in 1990 as a consultant neurosurgeon in Oxford. In Oxford, he developed his interest in skull-based tumours, oncology and vascular disease and established a regional center for the management of neurofibromatosis. He was one of the principal investigators of the International Subarachnoid Aneurysm Trial, which fundamentally changed the management of this condition. He has held numerous appointments, including the presidency of the Society of British Neurological Surgeons from 2014 to 2016, and he was elected to the Council of the Royal College of Surgeons of England in 2013. In that role, he has chaired the 2018 Independent Commission on the Future of Surgery, and it is on that subject that he's going to talk to us today. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much for that very kind uh, introduction, and thank you so much for asking me to deliver this. Uh, lecture to you on the future delivery of surgery. Um, I have no declarations to be made or conflicts of interest in uh, presenting this uh, talk to you. So is this the future? Do we see a future where the role of the doctor is taken over by uh, robots or avatars? Well, I don't think so. Um, and I certainly don't think so uh, in the short term. And I'm going to use this uh, lecture just to describe uh, some of the work that I've been doing in this area um, and why I think uh, that we're not heading for a situation where surgical delivery is done by uh, machine uh, rather than by uh, surgeons. The uh, explosion in connectivity, <clears throat> I think, has driven a lot of the changes that we've seen uh, in the digital world. Uh, and if you uh, just look at this in terms of the connectivity that's possible, um, if you go back to the 1980s, there were only a million things that could talk to each other. There are now over 50 billion uh, ways of uh, connectivity occurring. So this explosion has driven uh, what's been termed the fourth industrial revolution by Klaus Schwab, uh, who was chairman of the World Economic Forum. And of course, this uh, comes after the first, second and third industrial revolutions when we went uh, from mechanization, steam and water power to the fourth industrial revolution of cyber physical systems. What that means uh, and it applies to everything, not just medicine or indeed surgery, 
but it, it means about uh, new IT platforms. It means uh, advanced human machine interfaces. It means uh, specialized 3D printing, smart sensing, big data analytics. And of course, it means the augmented realities in terms of the immersive platforms. Um, now, as I've said, that applies to everything, whether it's industry uh, or the way that we run our office spaces to research, but it also applies uh, to medicine as well. It's already to some extent happening in the world of medicine. So for example, uh, remote brain surgery has already taken place in China where the patient and the surgeon were separated by 3,000 kilometers. So the technology uh, is there and the connectivity is there. But obviously what we need to work out is how we use this and how we use it to the very best advantage of our patients. The Commission uh, on the Future of Surgery, uh, which you was mentioned, uh, published in November 2018. And what that suggested was that there are going to be very rapid advances and they're going to be driven particularly by digital technology, uh, but also our biological understanding uh, of disease and treatments, particularly driven uh, by our knowledge of genetics and genomics. What's more is it's going to affect every type of surgery and it's going to affect the way we train and it's going to affect the way we deliver care. The anticipation is that surgery will become safer and hopefully less invasive, uh, but it's certainly going to be delivered uh, by teams rather than individuals. Now the commission identified four particular areas where we envisage those changes happening. Genomics and big data, in uh, imaging and the immersive platforms using uh, simulation AR, VR. In minimally invasive surgery, uh, and are uh, obviously robot assisted, but there are other aspects to that. And then there's a series of, of specialized interventions, which I'll, I'll just mention briefly. What's also clear is these changes can be applied throughout the entirety of the patient's journey uh, through hospital. So they can be applied in terms of trying to prevent disease in the first place, disease prediction and early diagnosis through treatment and rehabilitation, and then monitoring patients to try to identify early recurrence of disease. The genomic side, uh, this is gonna affect everything from newborn screening, identification of disease susceptibility, uh, screening and actually early diagnosis, and from that, prognosis and actually prognosis in terms of therapeutic outcome and that applies to surgery as well as any other form of medicine. We're already seeing um, things like the potential applications of liquid biopsy with early diagnosis of tumor DNA which circulates in our bloodstreams. Uh, there's been quite a lot of this in the press um, and I think this will only become used more and more frequently in terms of not only the early diagnosis of disease, uh, but actually the monitoring of disease as we go forward. Big data and data analytics using electronic health records, but also uh, using the data we're getting from the genomic studies which are ongoing. And if you link those in uh, to many of the public health records, this is going to give us a vast amount of information, but the drive for that information and the analysis of those data points is to get to a point of personalization of care. Uh, and I think that has to be the holy grail is what we want to get to, is an appropriate individualized uh, treatment pathway for each patient according to the disease profile that they have, taking into account their own personal situation. So what about the whole use of, of simulation? Well, it's already happening. And we are already beginning to move uh, to simulation from here where someone's putting in a central line to working within a simulation laboratory. This is taken for the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, uh, where they will have the whole team come in and actually under, under, 
uh, take various procedures which are videoed and recorded and then analyzed afterwards. Now, of course, with immersive technology, you can then take that into the virtual world as well. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be teaching and training in a virtual platform before any of these procedures are carried out on patients. Clearly that applies to our learning of anatomy as well in ways that perhaps we never thought of. Uh, and our ability to analyze complex structures in three dimensional images in a virtual space is going to mean um, much better ways of teaching and training at a time uh, when, when individuals, when students can do it on their own pace and often in their own time. Minimum invasive surgery, as I said, I think is going to uh, increase enormously, particularly with robotics. What's the benefit of robot assisted surgery? Well, I think there are many in terms of accuracy and precision, uh, access to various uh, areas of the body, the visual display in terms of 3D vision and magnification. Uh, the whole issue about tremor and ergonomics and comfort for the surgeon, I think is very appropriate. But with it, uh, we would expect faster recovery times with less pain. Ultimately, however, I think we need to look to robotics to improve outcomes for our patients. And one of those will be less variation uh, in outcomes. There is a cost implication in terms not only of purchase of the machine and the hardware that goes with it, but in terms of training and the training time. There is an issue about portability, but as you know, many of the robots are now becoming uh, much smaller and potentially uh, more portable. And with it, we also need to be collecting data so we can demonstrate evidence of effectiveness. Now, I think uh, the urology society is uh, much further advanced within this. And certainly my discussions with uh, urologists would indicate that they actually have a lot of data uh, which would demonstrate the potential benefits associated with robot assisted surgery. Now we can't not mention nanorobotics as well. There is a, a lot of work being done on nanorobotics and the potential. Uh, there are issues about nanorobots that are proving difficult uh, and that is the issue of steering them to get them to where you want to go to, whether it's to deliver drugs or to sample the tissues and then actually capturing them uh, afterwards. But uh, the work is ongoing. Of the specialized interventions that I mentioned, things like stem cell therapies, 3D bioprinting of tissues, uh, and indeed even neural prosthetics, including biointegration. And that too is already uh, taking place. Artificial organs, new bile ducts, uh, tracheas have been uh, developed as well. Uh, and in the world of transplantation, possibly the, the uh, possibility of animal to human transplants. These uh, novel treatments are going to be increasingly, however, dependent on specialized teams to be able to deliver those. And those specialized teams are going to include uh, engineers, chemists, bioinformaticians. So there's a huge diversity of skills that we needed to be brought in to enable us to really gain all the benefits from this. So the surgical team of the future is going to be uh, complex uh, with a lot of different players within it. More complex, I think, than the surgical teams that we have now. There's certainly going to be a continuing need for a large surgical workforce to meet the increasing demand. And it may be that a lot of that delivery of care is going to be competency-based uh, treatments. Now I'll come back to that and what that might mean for the future. So what of the surgeon? Is the surgeon going to change in this digital world? Well, I think the surgeon is going to change. And I think the surgical career will potentially become far less distinct uh, and more flexible. And we talk about the development of portfolio careers. Of course, there will always be the need for the coal-faced surgeon where he or she is working on a particular area of interest and spends a lot of their lives uh, operating on patients. However, I think we do need to move uh, to a situation where as surgeons, uh, yes, there will be times in our life when we are delivering uh, 
like surgical care, but there may be other times in our lives when we are teachers or trainers or mentors or managers or innovators. Uh, and I think the importance of those means that those times need to be reflected within our jobs and our job plans. Whereas at the moment, they're very much considered second place. I think in the, in the future, uh, that will be an integral part of our working life. Surgeons are going to have to become multilinguists as well. If we're to really harness and utilize all the benefits associated, for example, with application of genetics and genomics, then we need to understand the language uh, to be able to participate uh, in those complex MDTs and then discuss these issues with our patients. Greater role for non-surgeons, I mentioned that earlier on. Uh, I think it's an interesting concept. And indeed, there are already situations where non-surgeons are delivering uh, aspects of surgical care. Now, it may be that if we move to a competency-based framework, that there will be people within a team who have the competency to deliver aspects of surgical care that might not necessarily be the surgeon themselves. I think that's a very contentious issue and clearly we're not there yet, but I think the time will come when we may just have to think about that. The benefits for patients, well, I think the, the, the fact that if we can identify disease at an earlier time point in the natural history of that disease, we may be able to move to a situation of organ sparing surgery as opposed to organ removing surgery. And I think that will be a huge step forward. With that, less invasive techniques, which as I've said to you, will hopefully lead to less variation in outcomes. Faster recovery times, our ability to operate uh, on increasingly frail patients, uh, given that we are uh, an increasingly aged population, and particularly one that carries multiple comorbidities, I think we need to accommodate that within our delivery of surgical care. Shorter waiting times uh, with a more flexible surgical team. Obviously, the whole issue of waiting times is such a difficult problem uh, right now. And will we get to be able to replicate what happened with that operation for Parkinson's disease in China, where the patient and the surgeon were 3,000 kilometers away? Well, with a appropriate connectivity, with 5G connectivity, it may well be that actually uh, a surgeon delivering an aspect uh, of care may be helped and assisted and guided uh, by a colleague who may be in the next town or the next city or maybe even another country. Uh, whether the, surgeon it's, the surgery itself uh, will ever be completely remote in the way that it's being done in China, uh, I don't know. I think we've got uh, to think about that one very carefully. So let's just take all this and just think how that might apply to uh, some of the procedures that we're already doing. So these are the commonest operations that happen uh, in the UK over a five year period. So cataracts, there's two million cataract operations done uh, over five years, 400,000 per year. Femoral fractures, caesarean sections, arthroscopy, cholecystectomy, you can see the, the numbers there. So if we just look at cataracts and what might happen to cataracts if we adopt some of these new technologies that we're talking about. Well, in the next five years, there's clearly going to be an increase in demand, given that uh, population demographics that I've already alluded to. AI will undoubtedly help us in terms of diagnosing patients who have cataracts. And what's more, it may be that that will be diagnosed in a stratified way that will give us much more information about who's likely to deteriorate and at what speed, and therefore at what point should be intervening. Lens technology is already improving, so we're, we're moving towards smart lenses now, the lenses that will accommodate and give us that, uh, that depth of accommodation. Uh, augmented reality platforms for training, again, already in development, and whether the specialization of surgeons, that's something that the, uh, the ophthalmologists themselves were, were considering. 
If we then extend that over the next 10 to 20 years, well, undoubtedly, there's going to be a continued increase in demand. And by that stage, AI will almost be uh, routine in terms of diagnosis and stratification of that diagnosis. Robot-assisted surgery and potentially even remote surgery uh, as well. And then ultimately, the probability is that we'll be looking towards uh, rather than putting in a smart lens, we'll be using stem cells uh, in, placed into the lens capsule so we actually grow a new lens. So just within cataract surgery, actually all of those different areas that I talked about earlier on uh, are going to be utilized in this, which is the commonest surgical procedure, which is going to revolutionize the way that we deliver those aspects of care. So in terms of the future, what we need to be looking at, therefore, is the teaching and training and how we're going to do that, particularly uh, in the anticipated curricular changes and methods of learning. We're going to be looking at new devices and new techniques, and so we have to have standards and standards of care around those. The patterns of care, the drive is very much uh, towards early diagnosis and preventative care and surgery delivered as organ sparing. And of course, these are gonna to have to be kept under review through NICE, the GMC and the CQC. I think it's important to mention the whole issue of sustainability uh, and the development of green theaters. Uh, theaters are unfortunately a very uh, potent source uh, of particularly single use plastics. And I think we need to, to look very carefully uh, about that whole aspect of how we deliver our, our surgical care. So what about the teaching and training? Well, uh, we certainly look at that within the Royal College of Surgeons of England in terms of how we can change the way that we are delivering not only the current digests that are there, but the new forms of, uh, of teaching and training that we think are necessary if we're going to really utilize all these developments. Clearly the use of, simula of simulation and uh, virtual reality are going to increase the whole time. And that comes under a framework of digitization of, of training, moving training onto a digital platform, not only in the way that we uh, deliver that training, but actually in the way that we gather the information uh, about how training is going and how competency is delivering. Uh, we certainly see that we, we want to work actively with med students, trainees, industry, educationalists uh, and surgeons to train that and that's uh, to do that and that's something that we're doing. The, um, clearly there will be a need for other aspects of, of uh, training as well and that's about communications uh, skills and, and consent, it's about team building, it's about human factors training, uh, and it's about genomics. So there is an ongoing project about uh, how we move to e-learning projects, uh, how we engage with virtual reality and simulation, uh, and working with the HE Immersive Technology Initiative to try to develop these changes in the way we train surgeons and surgical teams for the future. So what about the robotics and the digital surgery? Uh, well, again, we've set up an initiative through the College of Surgeons of England, which is shortened for RADAR, which is the Robotic and Digital Surgery Initiative. So we've developed a steering group with Naeem Sumro, who will be known to, to all of you, I'm sure, and Simon Back, who's a colorectal surgeon in Birmingham, together with myself, Pete Hutchinson, who's a neurosurgeon in Cambridge, but head of research, David Beard, who's... Um, in the Lafayette Department of Surgery in Oxford, and Ralph is one of the directors. And what we want to try to do is put together a working group. Um, some of you have kindly already uh, are within that, looking at these key themes when it comes to robotic and digital surgery. So education and training, research, the development of professional standards, and then looking at service specification, particularly with uh, NHS England. The working group, um, you can see there's various colleagues there, um, uh, Professor Dasgupta, John McGrath, Professor Hamdi, Justin Collins, uh, colleagues in neurology, but there are colleagues from many other disciplines who are involved with this as we try to, to put together this robotics and digital working platform. 
Uh, what we've also done is develop liaisons with a series of stakeholders, including assets from the surgical associations, also industry partners, um, Cancer Research UK in the ideal, but with JCST and HEE, um, which I think is really important. And then uh, we're also uh, hoping to work with um, the College of Surgeons in Edinburgh as well. So if we look at those uh, key themes, um, just in a little bit more detail. Uh, the first is just to look at this concept about training and how can we utilize these technologies, particularly with uh, robotic technology in terms of helping training. Well, this comes into what's called the automated performance metrics. So if you look at um, the movements that a uh, expert surgeon will make as opposed to a novice or a trainee, and they can analyze the movements of an, of an instrument in terms of roll, pitch, and yaw. And you can collect those data items, and they're demonstrated here in the, in the middle of this presentation. You can see the actual movements that an expert will make are really very limited against a novice uh, whose range of movement is far, far greater. So that we can begin to analyze these data points and look at what that means in terms of outcome for the patient. Now on the basis of that, what we've begun to put together is a study called Mastery, uh, which is looking at these automated performance matrix. And the, the hope is that we can improve surgical training and patient care by analyzing these advanced uh, performance matrix and looking at it in terms of efficiency. So we can develop this within the robotic surgical data, correlate that in a clinical context, and then uh, using some of the advanced metrics, particularly from intuitive, develop programs uh, that will enable us, hopefully, to train young surgeons uh, utilizing these automated performance metrics. The anticipation is that they'll be able to gain the skills quicker when you see it uh, delivered in this way. Now, the other end of the spectrum is to look at the application of some of these techniques in real time. And that's another project we've set up called Reinforce with uh, David Beard and Marion Campbell uh, from uh, Aberdeen. Um, and this is to try to look at how we integrate a new technique like robot-assisted surgery and how we begin to evaluate its, its utilization um, in the surgical world, not only in terms of outcome, but also in terms of its economic impact. So that study too is up and running. Uh, obviously it's gonna take some time for these data items to be uh, available. So this is part of the changes in the digital platform that I was talking about in terms of training. I think we're absolutely gonna move away from the way that I trained, which was uh, very much patient-based training to a situation where we use um, immersive technologies to begin with, so virtual reality or augmented reality, to actually learn the procedures, the steps of the procedures, and some of the pitfalls within those procedures. We can then put that into a simulation, and we're uh, working with, with colleagues from some of the companies that I've mentioned here, like Proximy, Touch Surgery with HoloLens uh, and HoloMedicine, so that Trainees can acquire these skills, and indeed we may even be able to measure the acquisition of those skills using those uh, automated performance metrics that I've talked about before they're uh, put in, applied to the patient, which will come much later on in the training program. So you can begin to, to develop the concept of a digital skills hub uh, where augmented reality followed by simulation with these uh, automated performance metrics, and that would allow us to develop programs and machine learning uh, that will help, hopefully, in the training of the surgeons for the future. Now, it's interesting that I talked earlier on about the fact that we're, uh, when I started the work on the Commission on the Future of Surgery, we were talking very much about the fourth industrial revolution. Well, we're now on the cusp of the fifth industrial revolution and this is going to be driven by AI 
and this is the adoption and application of artificial intelligence when it comes to uh, analysis of data, when it comes to analysis of things like these performance metrics, when it comes to surgical training. And all of that's going to be on a digital platform. Interestingly, as part of the realization about the uh, fifth industrial revolution, is the importance actually of looking at work-life balance as well, the importance of looking at family, the importance of looking at personal health, the importance of taking time off uh, to take our vacations. And I think that uh, is a very different to a lot of what's happened in past years. And I would welcome that as part of the changes uh, that I see coming down the line when it comes to the application of surgical treatments and the training of our surgeons for the future, which is going to be very much on a digital platform uh, in its entirety. So is this the future? Well, as I said right at the beginning of this, I don't think it is the future. I certainly don't think it is the future in the short term. And what I'm going to leave you with is a, a quotation from uh, Joseph Weizenbaum, who for many will be considered one of the father figures of artificial intelligence. He was uh, a professor at uh, Massachusetts Institute, um, MIT, at the Mass Institute of Technology. Um, and he wrote a, a treatise in 1976 called Computer Power and Human Reason. Uh, and he put in that uh, something which I think is really important and something that within this digital world that we're talking about, we must never lose sight of. And that is that there are some things people come to know only as a consequence of having been treated as human beings by other human beings. And I think it is uh, because of that, because of the need for human touch and because of the human frailty that is around a lot of these diseases that we're talking about, uh, we're not going to move to a situation where our treatments are delivered uh, by however intelligent and however personal those robots or avatars might be. Uh, I think there will always be a need for that human touch. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much, uh, Richard, for that uh, extensive and uh, indeed very authoritative overview of what's happening and uh, what is going to happen both in the medium and perhaps in the long term. The rate of change is obviously quite uh, daunting for some, but uh, mm -hmm. hugely exciting, I'm sure. And we're very grateful to you for taking your time to share your knowledge and expertise with us uh, uh, in this lecture. Thank you very much indeed. It's a great pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Every year, uh, the BJUI awards three prizes to researchers from around the world. And the John Blandy Prize is awarded to the author of the best paper published in the BJUI for who comes from UK and Europe. This year, I'm delighted to announce that the winner is Nicholas Raisin from KCL for his paper, Cognitive Training for Technical and Non-Technical Skills in Robotic Surgery, a Randomised Controlled Trial. Nicholas. Well, thank you very much, Professor Sethia. I'm extremely grateful to you and to the British Journal of Urology for this very kind prize. I'm very honoured by it. And thank you for the opportunity of being able to share my research, Cognitive Training for Robotic Surgery. I'd also like to thank my supervisors and co-authors, in particular Professor Desgupta, who's been a fantastic mentor to me, as well as Professor Khan and Mr. Cameron Ahmed, who've been so supportive in my research, and my fellow researcher, Abdul Latif. And really just a little bit of background, I've been able to take some time to look into simulation training, and really the reason why it is so much at the forefront is that we have these competing needs at the moment, both of being increasingly aware of the outcomes following surgery, the potential complication and also mistakes following any kind of medical care, being balanced with the need to be able to provide effective training 
the need to be able to provide flexible training whilst also managing ever more limited resources. And it's being shown increasingly commonly now that simulation training is an excellent approach to achieving all of these aims. The Mars project is my PhD thesis, which I've recently been able to complete, in which I've been able to look at the multi-institutional validation and assessment of training across all aspects of robotic surgery. I was very fortunate in being able to collaborate with a number of institutes across Europe, and I'm very grateful for their input into my work. And really one of the key areas which I've been able to look at is the role of mental imagery training for robotic surgery and its role as an adjunct, a very important adjunct to training through all aspects of the learning curve. And so in terms of cognitive training, I'm sure it's something that you've heard yourself before. The brain training apps are now fairly ubiquitous, being able to keep you mentally sharp, but it's also been shown and now widely used, especially in elite sports, as a vital form of training. And in particular, motor imagery is a specific form of cognitive training whereby you rehearse the task in your mind without performing any mental or any physical movements in the aim of improving the performance of that task. And again, this has widely been shown to be beneficial in sports, in rehabilitation medicine, and to a lesser extent in surgery. And so we looked at how mental imagery or motor imagery training can be effectively used for surgery. The uh, most widely used technique is that of using a motor imagery script and we used a validated model known as a PETLET model and working together with uh, expert psychologists, academic psychologists from Dublin, we devised a motor imagery script and really the aim of this script is to provide a realistic as possible simulation in your mind of that task and make it as realistic as possible. And this has been shown to be very closely related to how effective motor imagery training will be. We're also able to assess how effective motor imagery is by using self-completed uh, questionnaires. And this is an example of the questionnaire we used for our trial. In regards to the trial itself, I completed a randomized trial in which 77 medical students underwent some initial robotic simulation training. Um, this was completed on a virtual reality simulator, followed then by randomization to either standard training in which they watched a video of a urethra cycle anastomosis or cognitive training. The cognitive training involved following a mental imagery script all the participants were initially taught how to perform this and then went away to perform the training themselves at home. All participants in both arms and returned for assessment. The technical skills were assessed using a validated uh, model, a urethrocytal anastomosis, a plastic model with the Da Vinci XI surgical robot. This was all done within a simulated operating in the room environment known as the igloo. Whilst it may not look realistic, it certainly does give a very realistic feel of an operating room. And this has also been shown in, valid, in multiple validation studies. We also then uh, undertook three scripted scenarios to test their technical, uh, their non-technical skills. This is just a short video clip. All performance was of a video recorded and then assessed by expert robotic surgeons and non-technical skills experts using uh, checklist scores. So on the basis of these results, we found that there was an indeed a significant difference between the performances of those in the control group and following mental imagery training, where the significantly higher scores, 13.1 versus 11.4 out of a maximum of 30 for the technical skills assessment. In contrast, non-technical skills were shown there'd be no difference between either arm. Importantly, alongside this, we also demonstrated that there was significantly higher imagery ability in the intervention arm. Following on from this study, I've been able to undertake a further pilot study um, as part of the MIND trial, mental imagery in neuroimagery for surgical development. And really the aims of this study is to try and develop the role of mental imagery further. 
the really the big limiting factor uh, in previous trials is the use of these subjective self-completed questionnaires assessing the imagery ability and therefore we've attempted to uh, look at the direct effects of imagery training using functional MRI and the particular technique you know as resting state which is able to assess the underlying functional organization of the various connections um, within the neuroconnector tone and looking at the effects of training of this it's been shown in multiple studies that short-term training does indeed affect resting state connectivity we wanted to see if the same effect was seen following motor imagery in our initial study we've taken four surgical trainees with some uh, intermediate level skill and laparoscopy they all underwent an initial fmri uh, imaging protocol where first of all we identified regions of interest by asking the participants to perform a simple laparoscopy action in the MRI scanner, and then use this to identify which areas of the brain we were going to be interested in for the further analysis. We then undertook a resting state scan. Participants then had their laparoscopic skills assessed, again, using a dry lab model. Again, videos, recordings of the performances were made, and then these were assessed blindly by an expert surgeon using two checklists. All participants were then taught motor imagery training using a similar checklist and again went away for two weeks and underwent self-directed training or at least once per day. Participants then returned after two weeks and underwent a similar protocol where they had their FNRI imaging followed by the laparoscopic skills assessment. In terms of our outcomes, we found six key regions of the brain which demonstrated activity during the localization task. We then looked in detail at these areas pre and post mental imagery training and found very interestingly that a single region between the prefrontal and frontal cortices identified here by the red and blue dots showed a significant increase in the connectivity after training compared to before. All other training all other regions showed no uh, significant difference with training. Technical skills assessment also showed there was an increase in scores based on the checklist and the goals uh, performer, although this does not meet significance. So on the basis of these results, we can say that motor imagery training for surgical tasks does improve technical skill and we've also been able to show in a small cohort that there are measurable changes in the resting state fun functional connectivity following motor imagery training. And really what I look forward to and being able to do in the future is developing this further and aiming to include motor imagery training as a key component in the surgical curriculum. Many thanks for your time.